Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, greetings from Leicester in the UK. It's a cloudy day here, which is quite typical for this time of the year. And it's 11 o'clock, as Michael said. Uh, and you, where are you based right now? Type in the chat, please. Where are you based? So, yeah, Indonesia, Tokyo. Oh my God, really international. Korea, Japan, South Korea, Japan. Excellent, so keep them coming. Um, I must confess that I'm very, very happy to be giving this plenary for Cortiso. And when Michael invited me, I was over the moon um, because it's my first time speaking at a Cortiso conference. And also the topic of digital literacy is very, very close to my heart and a field I've been researching for years. And another reason I'm really happy is that since March 2020, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been giving uh, many, many keynotes and presentations and trainings, all on the topic of online learning, blended learning, hybrid learning, in order to help language professionals adapt smoothly or as smoothly as realistically possible uh, to this new reality. Um, so I'm very excited that this is not about online learning, but of course it can be applied to online learning and teaching as well, because online is the perfect context for digital literacies. Uh, that said, we need digital literacies in the face-to-face -face classroom as well. So while I'll be presenting, you may want to think about both contexts, face-to-face -face and online. So uh, Michael has introduced me already, which is uh, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just to say, I'll be speaking wearing all these hats on. Um, but most of all, I think I identify myself as a teacher. I teach in higher education in the UK. In the past, I used to teach in primary and secondary education. So very much of what I'll be talking about comes from research, but also classroom experience, which is, uh, which is important. I think it's important to not just talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Um, so I'm going to share at the end my contact details and everything, and Michael said that he's going to share my website. For now, if you're going to be tweeting, this is my Twitter handle. So, um, okay, just a short overview. Uh, we will define digital literacies, and then I'm going to share a digital literacy digital literacy framework, and then we will try, we will attempt to re-envision ELT through this lens. And at the end, I'm going to share some practical ideas about how we can embed digital literacies um, into the curriculum, the classroom, and we will finish with a Q&A session, and it will all take around uh, an hour. So, I would like to start with a short story. Um, last year, in, in January uh, 2020, I gave a keynote. It was my penultimate face-to-face -face, uh, keynote. The last one was in Mexico. Um, and um, that was in BET in London. Have you ever heard of BET or have you visited? Have you? Yes, no. Have you heard? No. No, no, no. Okay, so it is really yes, no. Okay, so it is uh, a massive conference and exhibition that takes place every January in, in London about educational technology and brings together uh, teachers and leaders from all around the world. And the keynote. Uh, was about helping students to manage digital distractions. Um, 
and in the classroom. And I, in this keynote, I challenged um, the educational systems. Remember, that was before the pandemic, a little bit before the pandemic. So I challenged um, the educational systems that um, ban uh, or that simply banned uh, digital devices from the classroom in an attempt to help students to manage their digital distraction. So what I argued was that managing digital distractions is a learning skill that needs to be developed in the context of learning. And that this is from the classroom. We also deprive students from the opportunity to, uh, of the opportunity to, to, to develop this skill. So I don't know what the situation was and the school policies were in Korea before the pandemic, but in Europe, it started in 2019, the French government passed a law banning mobile phones across all schools in France, um, Canada, some schools across the UK and other European countries such as Spain, um, Greece, um, the US were enacting or thinking of enacting similar uh, policies. Treating the symptom, not the problem. So I talked about all this in January, 2020. In less than two months, in March, 2020, it was the same educational systems in, in Europe and the US uh, and Canada that asked students, I'm saying these uh, uh, places because uh, perhaps um, in other countries it was earlier. Um, so it was the same educational systems that asked students to move online and use their devices for learning. And they were blaming the students and they're still blaming the students for being distracted by Instagram and TikTok instead of focusing on the lesson. But then they could not just simply ban the devices from the classroom because their classroom was in the devices. Okay. Kirsten, in Korea, my elementary students have their phones. Okay, you're in the class. All right, that's great to know. So you can find the recording of this keynote in the references, but why am I saying all this? Because I believe that many of the issues and the struggles that teachers experience right now would have been avoided if educational systems had been more proactive with regards to the skills that students need for the learning in real life. I don't mean proactive in terms of the pandemic, predicting the pandemic, uh, because this was beyond any imagination, but understanding that the concept of literacy is shifting to include digital literacies as well. And somehow, integrated into their curricula, taking into consideration what it means to be literate in the 21st century. So, and the pandemic is not the only phenomenon which disrupted education. There are many other concerns that my respected uh, colleagues have addressed and will continue to address during this conference. For example, with machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and text-to-speech translation uh, becoming increasingly accurate. Many teachers, many of us wonder uh, whether people will need to master English at all in the not so distant future. And our uh, keynote speaker, Jared Leonard, gave some spot-on answers on this on Friday. And my own answer to this will be given at the end of this talk when I hope everything will fall into place and will make better sense. What does this have to do with digital literacies, for example? So um, typically, perhaps in the 20th century, uh, being literate meant the ability to read and write 
and understand numbers. But this is changing from cognitive science, sociolinguistics, computing, digital humanities. Scholars seem to agree that the concept of literacy in the 21st century is increasingly shifting to include new skills and new values associated with the role of technology in human life. It is very difficult to speak anymore about the offline and the online world as two separate uh, things. And I think that the pandemic made this uh, clear that the online and offline uh, worlds intersect increasingly to become one world where we work, learn, communicate, have conferences like this one. So if we perceive literacy in general as a concept, not as a static ability to deal with texts, but as an intellectual empowerment that can change us cognitively and socially, in the same way, digital literacy cannot be seen as just the skills for using computers. It is so much more than this. So let's try to define it. So I find this definition, there are many definitions. I find this definition very comprehensive and I think it hits home for us language professionals. So the skills, according to the House of Lords, digital literacy and literacies refer to the skills to use, create and critique digital technologies and the knowledge to critically understand the structures and the syntax of the digital world and to be confident in managing new social norms. So we are not talking about only knowing how to use computers, um, social media, how to create videos and all these amazing things that need technical skills. We need to understand the syntax and the structures and critique information and manage social norms in order to live and navigate that the, the world that we live in. So <clears throat> the problem is that this intellectual empowerment that I just described um, won't just happen because we use technology. Research overwhelmingly confirms that exposure to technology does not mean, does not equal understanding technology. Just because we are online doesn't mean that we have this deep understanding and knowledge that I just described. Even before the pandemic, our students spent three to four hours online per day, but they still got distracted, fell for fake news, were cyberbullied, plagiarized, didn't know how their data was used when they were online, etc. And there is no such thing as digital natives either. The term was coined in 2001 by Prensky to refer to a distinction between the young and the old with regards to technology. But recent papers and Prensky himself acknowledge that such dichotomy oversimplifies things and that the real picture, empirical evidence uh, suggests that the real picture is far more complex and that fluency, that our students, our students are very fluent users of technology. So fluency, exposure, technical competence, they don't mean digital literacy. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so this is the complete framework 
and we will take a closer look in a bit in an interactive way so be prepared to participate as well it's not going to be just me talk 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 um, so if you want to read the whole chapter, you will find it in my latest co-edited book by Express Publishing, English for 21st Century Skills. So this is from a chapter. It is important to say here that digital literacy cannot be transmitted or acquired as an add-on. For example, it cannot be a section in the course book. Eh? Okay, I'm, I'm doing reading, I'm doing some writing here. Okay, I'll put here a part um, about digital literacy. No, it is a lived experience that should be embedded in what we do in the classroom. And, and it involves computers, of course, it does involve computers. It is mediated by computers. But as I said earlier, it is not just about the skills for using computers. So we are going to take a look at all these literacies and re-envision ELT through this lens. And just to say that all these literacies are important, all these uh, here, um, we need them all, of course, but we also need to be realistic about what we can and what we cannot do as language teachers. The idea here is not to turn our language students into digital literacy experts. That would be unrealistic. But I see two aims for us, language professionals. First, to equip them with the learning skills that they need to learn a language. They need these skills to learn a language. And second, to help them to develop one of the most important set of 21st century skills. And in this way, to make learning relevant for them. So these are the skills and competencies that students need now, and they will need in the future. And someone might ask, uh, Sophia, can we not learn a language without being digitally literate? Of course we can, of course. But here, there are other questions what is a language? What does it mean to learn a language? Are languages separate from the world that we live in? Or do they reflect cognitive and social norms and interactions? So simply put, and I think that it sums it up uh, all nicely, uh, Michael Carrier in his foreword from the book I was telling you about, English for 21st century skills. Um, as educators, we need to ensure that what we teach is what people actually need for their real lives in the real world. But enough from me. I want to, uh, to hear from you now. So let me check the time. Yes, excellent. So let's take a look at this literacies, access and core IT skills. What do you think that these literacies involve? Can you give me some examples? One example, give me one example. So what does it mean? Using shared, excellent, thank you, Brian. How to search for information on the internet, excellent, Jasmine. Uh, how to set up an account, fantastic. Yes, thank you. Strong internet connection, Pina, thank you very much. So keep them coming, keep them coming, excellent. So <clears throat> you're, you're all absolutely right. So access and core IT skills for the, form the basis of digital literacies, representing the ability to read and write in the analog world. This is where we start from. This includes access to, as you said, fast and affordable internet. Eh? If there is internet that it is very expensive, then I don't have access. Um, and of course, because this access is not equal around the world, we have the so-called digital divides. And there were digital divides before the pandemic, of course, not just in the third world countries, 
but also in high connectivity countries like the US, say, and the UK, the were digital divides, but the pandemic made them more apparent. So for some students, this is where they need to start from. And I don't mean that they need the latest iPad or MacBook, but they do need decent bandwidth to be able to develop digital literacies and learn. Of course, before the pandemic, if a student didn't have fast internet at home, they could go to a cafe or a library. Unfortunately, COVID exposed many disparities and divisions in this regard and other regards. Um, so I live and work in the UK and not all my students have the same access to decent internet and devices. So this is something else that, as I said, COVID-19 made, made clear that 20 years into the 21st century, there are still huge digital divides between those who have access to technology and those who don't. So this is something that society needs to work on after the pandemic. During the pandemic, that would be great, but definitely after the pandemic. This should be one of the primary aims. Now, thank you, Brian. Yeah, email skills. Yeah, we were an important part of the EAP that I taught last year. That's fantastic. So, participation and collaboration. What do students need to know to participate and collaborate effectively online? Over to you. Discussion, discussion skills over Zoom, excellent. What else? What else do you think? Give me some examples. Ability to negotiate, that's fantastic. Yeah. Nonverbal communication. Excellent. How to disagree constructively, Sean. Yes. Trash, Stephen. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Keep them coming. Fantastic. So participation and collaboration literacies can provide students with the skills and the mindset, not just the skills, to use shared productivity tools such as Google Drive, for example, just an example, communicate and collaborate effectively um, online via text, video, audio, understand different genres and codes of digital interaction, email versus text, for example. There are different codes of communication here. Understand emoticons as paralinguistic features to show emotion. Otherwise, text can be misunderstood and there have been lots of misunderstandings already um, because uh, misunderstandings of tone, I mean. Um, uh, something else, respect diverse cult cultural norms. Eh? Uh, with regards to our um, posting, we don't post 10 selfies a day because we know that this is, a, is bad taste. It comes across as desperate. And I'm not here to criticize anyone. I'm just talking about understanding codes and digital cultures. So we know how to build uh, digital networks, for example, to participate in professional and social life, personal learning networks. Our students need to create their own personal learning networks. So what can we do to promote these literacies as language educators? Think of Next, creativity and innovation. What can language students create with technology and why is it important? Over to you guys. What can they create? What do you think? Multimodal texts, excellent. Dreams, Julian, excellent. Writing that people actually read blogs, excellent content, content, short videos, infographics, excellent posters, vlogs, 
characters. Great, thank you, thank you. Fantastic, keep them coming. So um, yes, creativity and inno innovation. Our students create uh, content and these skills, this literacy, this mindset can equip students with the competencies of designing, remixing, creating, curating, curating um, content, digital media, resources, web pages, images, audio, video, music, apps, graphics. So coding is a great digital literacy, but of course this doesn't mean that uh, we all need to know how to code. Um, that's a part of it. Uh, very relevant to us is using technology to support research and problem solving and creating content, as you very, very well said, while respecting copyright and authorship and being able to synthesize online information into their own original argument. Do students have these literacies? They might be able to design and remix, but how can we use this for language learning? And can they really remix by uh, respecting authorship and ownership? We know that students plagiarize. Many times they don't plagiarize because they're lazy. They do because they lack these literacies. So one of my favorites, identity and well-being. What are the challenges that students may face regarding digital well-being, digital responsibility, and e-safety? Over to you guys. Recognizing false information. Thank you very much, Ria. What else? So what are the challenges that they may face when they are online, when they create, when they collaborate? Um, we were discussing well-being for teachers. Thank you. Excellent bullying. Screen time. Knowing when to turn off devices. Sean, Kirsten, dealing with bullying. Insecurity when being recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Navigating. Thank you. So all fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> keep them coming, please. Um, so there are some very, very important questions and issues here. And I would say that these literacies are about understanding the reputational implications of digital identity, of existing online. And there are both opportunities and risks. We should not be focusing only on the risks um, and being resilient to risks, to, to risk. Uh, we can't avoid risk. For example, managing digital disruptions, technology, despite the enormous opportunities, is chronically distracting us. What can we do about that? So, as you said, developing a positive digital footprint, managing personal data, developing e safety skills, etc., handling cyberbullying and trolling. Trolling is a is you know is um, some kind of cyberbullying, uh, both reactively but also proactively. And apart from the mechanisms and help, uh, help helplines and uh, and support, that may be the school the school's responsibility, not ours. We need to develop kids' ability, students' ability to deal with cyberbullying, to know how to report it, to not be scared because this is what bullies and trolls want. So this is easier said than done. And this is why raising awareness is not enough. Students need the skills and the mindset to do that. So last but definitely not least, digital criticality. What does it mean for language students? What do they need to know to be able to do? What do you think? Fitri, yes, standing up once in a while. <laughs> Great. So digital criticality, netiquette. Thank you, Pinar. Identi identify fake news, Filmer, yes. Spotting fake news, Michael. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, <coughs> keep sharing your ideas. Um, 
finding community. Yes, understand cultural difference in language. Thank you, Ria. So digital criticality um, gives students the skills and the confidence to, as you said, assess source reliability, as well as analyze and interpret information online. And I don't know if you agree with me, with the onset of COVID-19, the ability to identify fake news has become more than ever a matter of life and death. <laughs> and um, some people ask me, Sophia, digital criticality is critical thinking, isn't it? And the answer is no, not only. You need to know the digital very well because messages and content and information come out in various forms, not just text. It can be links, it can be hyperlinks, it can be pop-ups, it can be uh, video, sound, image, Photoshop image. So you need to know the digital media well to develop digital, digital criticality. Uh, the last one, um, echo chambers. Do you know what they are? What do we mean by echo chambers? What is echo chambers? Being surrounded by only by people of yes, of like opinion, rare, thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> Michael, environment, go to Israel now, John. No, okay, okay, okay. So um, echo chambers. Um, the information that we consume online is increasingly mediated by filter bubbles. Algorithms whose job is to make content, content increasingly personalized through guessing what the user would like to see. Another example is our PLNs. We tend to follow like-minded people, and rightly so. However, this creates online environments that are populated by essentially agreeable information. And these are our echo chambers. Now, echo chambers are not new, of course, and they exist offline and online as well. But the exposure and reach is so massive online that it has given echo chambers a whole new meaning. So understanding when you are in a bubble and when you are not is essential. And also, um, from time to time, not all the time, breaking out of our echo chambers and being exposed to more diverse ideas and perspectives is a major digital literacy that needs a high level of criticality. So echo chambers cannot be avoided, but they need a certain level of criticality, otherwise they can lead to polarization and misinformation. And we've seen a lot of this lately. And our students need to develop this literacy as well. So taking the time, excellent, excellent. So uh, now this is, um, this question is a little bit obvious, I know, but it will help us to recap and give you the opportunity to reflect on what we said. No need to answer, just reflect on it. Why do language students need these literacies? Just reflect on it. So these literacies are particularly important for students learning English, for our students, to be better able to learn the language that they need in the 21st century. Eh? And I will just highlight some bits here. To participate effectively in online communities, even if you teach face to face, you want to create an online community, a blog, a forum, or whatever online community to exchange ideas, for students to exchange ideas, to practice the language, 
but do students have the skills to participate, communicate, collaborate with other people online? We can set up wonderful projects, give attention to the pedagogy and all that, but without these skills, they won't be able to go ahead. Respect ownership and avoid plagiarism. We ask students to do research and project work and all these amazing things. But we all know that they copy from the internet and they pass it off as their own, not always because they're lazy or because they want to cheat, but because they don't know how to synthesize information into their own original argument. Um, evaluate the credibility of online content, as we said, fake news, whole political campaigns have been won based on fake news. It is really relevant to them to know how to evaluate the credibility of online information. And manage digital distractions uh, in class or when they do homework. Uh, they are not distracted because they are lazy they can't help it. Technologies are distracting. Algorithms and digital devices create FOMO, fear of missing out, which is a form of anxiety or obsession, and it can challenge our concentration. And when it comes to our students, it can interfere with the learning. And that's why managing digital distractions is a learning skill. And by banning the devices in the face-to-face -face classroom, of course, because online, we just can't. By banning the devices, we can only treat the symptom, not the problem. And of course, of course, we need, students need these literacies. Uh, to learn online. We often say that teachers should be trained and they were not ready to teach online and all that. But what about students? Just because they are fluent users of technology doesn't mean that they know how to learn online, how to communicate online, how to curate content online without getting lost, uh, how to manage their time and their distractions. We need to help them to develop these skills by adding small bits of digital literacies to our teaching. So especially for online teachers and remote teachers, this is extremely important and it cannot wait because students need these skills and competencies. It will make such, such a big difference to their learning and it will also make life easier for you. So, moving on, all right, so what can we do? How can we integrate digital literacies in the language classroom? Um, Task-based learning, project-based learning are my preferred approaches to integrate digital literacies because the primary focus of every activity is the meaningful task while the language is the instrument that students use to complete the task. The other approach that I find useful, especially during the pandemic, when we don't have the time to redesign the approaches and the syllabus, let's face it, uh, is bite-sized digital literacies, uh, small chunks that may take 10 minutes from your classroom, but they will make such a big difference. So let's give some examples. Uh, as I said, task-based learning, project-based learning are my preferred approaches. They work in the face-to-face -face classroom, in the online synchronous classroom, and they can be excellent for the asynchronous classroom as well. So we can set a task um, and ask them to produce something following a task-based learning approach, of course, um, and this something depends on the level you're teaching and what digital literacy you want, you want your students to develop, so I cannot be prescriptive right now, but I can give an example. 
uh, the, the fourth bullet point, for example. Uh, an example might be how-to tutorials. It can be used with young learners, with teenagers, to university students, of course, a different task. But the idea here is that students work in groups to create short how-to videos or presentations, how-to with narration. They can use a screencasting tool or they can use their phones to create the video. It is not the tool that matters. It is the design of the activity that matters. Tools don't create learning. Technologies don't create learning. Activities, good activities do, and teachers do. So depending on the level, it can be for young learners, how to draw a heart. Eh? how to make a recipe, how to keep your study space organized when you learn online, how to, say, to stay safe online, how to use a technology eh? for teenagers or for adults, how to use an app, how to create Instagram stories. Um, so it can be anything really, and you know your students better than anyone else. So students create these five minute projects, they should be short, Otherwise, they might create cognitive overload to people who watch them uh, with narration. And they also, um, after they create them, you ask them to give feedback to at least two other projects that their classmates have created. So they share their creation, their how-to um, video on the LMS, model, at Modo, whatever LMS you're using. And then they are asked to watch at least two of their classmates how to tutorials and comment, comment on them. So what I love about this is that it ticks so many boxes and can be part of their assessment too. Uh, so social learning, scaffolding each other, group work, even if it doesn't go well, they can reflect on what didn't go well and understand that collaboration is not easy, especially when it is online and asynchronous. It is a skill that they need to develop and have to pick that, but it, it won't just happen, that we need to try. It is a 21st century skill. It is a digital literacy. So the last one, the last bullet point, um, we can also teach uh, digital literacies in chunks, as I said, before or after a lesson that involves uh, technology. For example, if students create something, let's say that they create an e-portfolio, a poem, a story, encourage them to license their work and publish it online or for a broader audience, if, this is, if there are privacy concerns, uh, for a broader audience, not just the classmates and the teacher in order to understand from the creator's perspective why authorship matters. Ask them to reflect on the opportunities and the issues that open uh, access spaces create. We have all this wonderful information at the click of a button, and this is a blessing, but digital spaces need to be populated by people who respect authorship and ownership and credit other people's work. So, closing. With machine learning, artificial intelligence and translation tools, as, um, as I said at the beginning, becoming increasingly accurate and sophisticated, there has been a lot of discussion as to whether people will actually need to master a foreign language at all. For example, with tools like Google Translate and Microsoft Stream, oh my God, this is an amazing tool. Why would people need to learn English? Yes, all these will indeed generate a lot of concern in the near future. Uh, but my answer to this is that machines will never be able to teach values and empowering literacies, such as the ones that we looked at today. 
and other 21st century skills, not only digital literacies, such as empathy, inclusion, well-being, leadership, adaptability. So computers are and will always be most effective at performing routine tasks. The kind of teaching and assessing routine tasks, the kind of teaching and assessing that very, very probably will no longer need people to do. So I think that if we realize this, then we will stop perceiving technology as a threat to our profession, but as a powerful ally that can play an instrumental role in our efforts to develop students' language skills and the new literacies that we talked about today. And yes, the world that we live in is highly complex, fast-paced, and ever-changing, and students need new literacies to learn and function. But to echo Kobo, the author of a fantastic open access book that talks about privacy and how our data is used and algorithms, and you will find it in the references. Um, download and read it. Education is still the most powerful tool to prepare people to function in these highly, highly complex environments, such as the world that we live in. So it is my belief that if we re-envision ELT through this lens, then we will find ourselves in a very powerful position. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So this is the first slide of the references. You can take a picture if you want. The first slide of references, if you want to go back and read. Uh, and this is the second slide of the references. And if you want to refer to this uh, session, you can use this citation. And here are my contact details. Uh, feel free to connect. Let's connect, let's connect. If you follow me, I will follow you back or you can email me or you can follow my website. Thank you very, very, very much. And I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to take questions. I think we have time. Yes, we have 10 minutes. We do. <laughs> um, could you just stop sharing your screen so that I can see who yeah. has the hand raised? Of course. Do I see any questions? Let me see if I see any hands. Sorry, there's a lot of you. It can be questions, it can be, you know, some comments if you want to share something, not necessarily questions. Oh, if, if there are not, but yeah. I see Brian, Brian has one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about the difference. Uh, a while ago, you said that digital criticality is not the same as critical thinking. And I'm wondering yeah. if you can expand that a little bit. Yeah. I said that you need to know the media very well in order to understand uh, the digital part of it. For example, my dad is a great critical thinker, but his digital criticality is 10%, perhaps zero sometimes. He cannot understand, for example, if a picture is Photoshopped and it is so obvious um, and many, many other for example, so I think you got the idea. So of course, one part, you need to be a critical thinker, but without the digital part, without the media, um, you know, understanding the media, then it is very, it is impossible to be, to have this, to develop this kind of digital literacy. And I talked about links, hyperlinks, um, you know, many, many clever and, uh, you know, critical thinkers might click on links that they shouldn't be clicking, um, if you know what I mean. Ray, Rhea had a question about how we can, how can we teach students to license their work? Oh, yeah, that's a good one because I do it. So, um, 
Creative Commons is a good license because it gives uh, the author, the owner, the rights, but also it is free, it is open access. So it is very easy for students to create Creative Commons uh, licenses and license their work. Uh, so if you type in Creative Commons license, it will bring you, you know, all the options and how we can license, um, you can license your work. So basically, this gives the students uh, the perspective of the creator and why, why uh, authorship and ownership matters and why crediting people's work matters from the perspective of the, of the creator. It is really important. Yes, thank you, Michael. Always so fast. Uh, <laughs> I see uh, Giorgios Korpas has a question. He has his hands raised and raised. very polite. Or maybe he was just waving goodbye. Hi there. No, yeah. I, no, I'm, I'm, no I'm, I'm here. Hi. Um, Hi, George. Hi, Hi, Michael. Hi, Sophia. How are you? Um, <laughs> So <laughs> very interesting plenary, thank you. So I just wanted to ask, you know, with all this influx of technology now and uh, all the online expansion, do you think that, you know, new models of education are going to be supported? Like, you know, uh, universities that will have, you know, students spread around the world all the time. And, uh, you know, if that is going to move on, how is that going to affect students and, you know, connectivity and their knowledge in general as um, English language learners? Mm -hmm. I think that we will see lots of changes um, in the near future with regards to um, these models that you refer to. Hybrid learning, for example, might be a model. I know that many universities and schools are currently exploring this, uh, this model, and I have been um, part of, the, of, 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 of a I participated in a research project, which is open access. I will, you will find it in my website anyway. So that shows that uh, language education is currently exploring these models. I see blended learning definitely being um, adopted after the pandemic because, uh, you know, I think that teachers have learned so much during the pandemic that we don't just want to throw it away uh, out of the window and not use it. Uh, of course, this will involve um, digital literacies, again, uh, not only for students, but also for, for teachers, because the way that um, the shift was, um, you know, took place um, was quite bumpy and rightly, I mean, understandably, understandably, because it happened so fast. After the pandemic, we will have the time to, uh, to see what is missing and fill in the gaps. So what I've been talking about today was not only for, for students, because the, perhaps the biggest question that I didn't raise is, okay, uh, can teachers teach? these literacies, don't, some of them, don't they need to develop them first and then teach them? And then, of course, we cannot blame the teachers. We cannot blame the teachers. Then it is the system or the school that they need to integrate some kind of professional development, not just, not leave it, you know, um, to the teachers to self-organize as it happened in the emergency remote teaching. Eh? Most of the teachers self-organized uh, their, their, their training because there was no time. So what I'm saying is that this involves, this realization, understanding and re-envisioning ELT through this lens needs work, needs change, but I think that teachers have proved that they're not afraid of this. We just need to make it clear to our educational systems that we need support. I mean, we support one another, but we need support from the educational systems as well. It is very, very difficult to do all this on our own. Thank I don't you. Know Thank if you I so much. Thank you. You did very well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Okay.
Okay, let me see if there are any more questions. Anyone have any more burning questions? If not, we can take this into the Discord chat. And Sophia, if you would be so kind as to send me your references, I can post them as a slide Absolutely. in there. Yeah. We'll yeah, get yeah, that yeah. done. And uh, <laughs> Rhea asks, when is she coming back to Cotessel? I don't know yet. <laughs> in person one day hopefully one day, one day. and i can't i can't speak yeah. Greek, but i can use google translate so i've popped that into the chat for everybody <laughs> i'm afraid it's only me and george who are, who are able to read that but it, this is so sweet yeah. michael says karistopoli sofia thank you very much sofia so that was so inspiring and amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay, good. And we have two extra minutes. Someone ask her a question. Greg, <laughs> hurry up. All right, thank you everybody for coming. Remember, you can watch this plenary again. We'll have it, uh, we we'll, should have it up in the Encore presentations or the video library or the YouTube playlist or somewhere tomorrow, by tomorrow, probably, or maybe not. We work as fast as we can. So applause for Sofia. Excellent, excellent, excellent.